Okay, so thank you all for coming uh, on the uh, presentation of the last uh, of the six working uh, groups of uh, this year's Balkan Forum. This one is uh, this one was discussing on uh, media and the public sphere, and uh, today we are here to present you the point we came to through throughout uh, our discussion. My name is uh, Boris Posnikov, and I uh, was a coordinator of uh, this uh, working group. Um, when I was thinking at the beginning of how to uh, how to uh, put uh, uh, different people together, my uh, main idea was to avoid, uh, on the one hand, uh, uh, this uh, option where, where I would have only uh, like uh, theoreticians or people from uh, academic field, and uh, on the other hand, I want uh, I wanted to avoid this. Uh, a uh, situation where uh, there will be only uh, journalists. So uh, at the end, uh, we managed to um, put together a pretty in interesting group in which there are people who are journalists, people who are uh, editors, people from the uh, academic field, and uh, 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 people even from the uh, policy uh, policy making uh, state uh, institutions. Uh, uh, so we have uh, um, institutionally wise uh, quite uh, uh, quite in, uh, interesting group. Uh, unfortunately, t t two of the members are not here. Uh, Irina Nedeva, a journalist from uh, Bulgaria, had to had to go uh, back to Bulgaria this morning. Uh, Andre Andre Nikolidis from Montenegro uh, mysteriously disappeared. I'm not sure where is he. Uh, from the from my uh, right to to my uh, left, uh, here are the uh, other members uh, of video. Tihid. Thanks, I'm sorry. Uh, Milan Živković from uh, uh, Croatia, uh, Sasha Slacek from Slovenia, and uh, our uh, discussant Dan Hind from uh, UK. Uh, okay, so. Uh, our task was, uh, as far as I uh, can see it, uh, firstly to, to provide some kind of basic analysis of media field because uh, in the uh, left and the Marxist uh, discourse, uh, uh, media, media problematics uh, is uh, 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 a, a, a bit neglected in the recent, in the recent, in the recent, uh, in the recent um, uh, period, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> compared to compared to its uh, f fashionability, uh, compared to the to the uh, uh, fact that it's uh, quite a fashionable uh, uh, issue in the in the field of I don't know cultural studies, the, uh, some kind of post-structural uh, theory, and, and and so on. So uh, at first we had to provide some kind of uh, basic analysis uh, analysis of uh, uh, media field in in Balkans in uh, recent uh, years, and uh, of course the the other thing that was ex uh, expected from us was to provide some kind of uh, less or more concrete uh, alternative to the to the uh, present situation, which is uh, obviously uh, quite an uh, Quite an, uh, a big task, uh, uh, quite an, uh, 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 a hard thing to do in in in, in such a uh, uh, in such a uh, short amount of time with with uh, with such a, a small number of people, uh, but. Uh, uh, my, uh, the, the 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 decision to to invite uh, uh, Mr. Dan Hind uh, provide us the uh, provided us the opportunity to present uh, one kind of uh, 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 okay pr pretty concrete uh, uh, media ref uh, reform model, uh, which is called public uh, commissioning. Uh, so I decided, uh, firstly, to to uh, give the floor to uh, Dan Hind, and then we'll uh, make our points with reference uh, to uh, his uh, model. So Dan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, thanks very much uh, for the invitation. I've been um, uh, hugely um, uh, energized by the conversations that I've had here and the opportunities I've had to. Uh, to hear some of the debates that are kind of regional and European, but also kind of global in scope. I'm going to talk very quickly about some of the background ideas, then give some sort of sketch of what, I'm, what I propose in, the, in, in my book, 
um, and then deal with one or two um, of the kind of comebacks that, have, that, have, that I've come across. And what we can learn, I think, from the criticisms um, that tend to emerge when you start talking about what I'm talking about, which is democratic reform of the media. Um, Boris makes the point that, that the media is under-theorized uh, on the ra radical left at the moment. It's important to emphasize that it's, it's a matter of deep and abiding interest to the capitalists at the moment. Uh, if you look at what Google is doing, Google is funding a vast communications effort to make us think about the media in a certain kind of way as it moves from a broadcast regime into a digital regime. This is a matter of, of uh, deep significance uh, in the way that the media system relates to the state, how the media system relates to its audiences. Uh, if, if we don't intervene in that, that debate uh, in a much more energetic way, uh, I think we'll miss out on a, a very important opportunity uh, for deep, deep change. So let me begin by just saying what I think are the two main legitimating stories that you find in mainstream discussions of the media. These are the discussions of the media that take place in the media, the discussions of the media that are, are not critical fundamentally in their nature. Um, but they are pervasive and they, they pretty much uh, exhaust our options. The first is to say that we can rely on the free market to give people what they want. Right? The second is the argument that we can rely on experts to give us what we need. So those two, are the, those two broad axioms are what you find in discussions of the media. You can dramatize that, that, that those two families uh, of legitimation in my country by thinking in terms of the arguments used to justify the BBC on the one hand and the arguments used to justify News International on the other. Okay, so in my country people say we need the BBC because we need a, a group of professionals who can determine in a dispassionate and professional way what is important, what is not, who can ma maintain a responsible degree of control over the public sphere, who can keep extremist views out and so on. And therefore we need an institution like the BBC. The other, uh, the other move is, that you find uh, in defenders of the private media is to say the market determines outcomes. If you want to publish your Marxist magazine, you can do so, and if people find it interesting, you'll gain, uh, you'll gain uh, a foothold in the market, people will pay for your production. The fact that there is very little in the way of radical media that, that, that succeeds in the marketplace only reflects the fact that you're out of touch. Uh, your ideas do not resonate with the public. Now, these two families of legitimation often appear as antagonists. Okay, um, they are, uh, but they are just as often to be found as partners. Okay, and so in, in the real world, or when big business is lobbying states about media policy, they'll use these two legitimations in a, in a strategic or a tactical way to secure what they want. So one of the problems that we find is that any attempt to think critically about the media runs into opposition from uh, what I would call a public service model of how the media should be organized, um, who will say, if you, if you question the public sector, or you question public service media, you leave the way open uh, to people like Rupert Murdoch and to the, the media magnates. A couple of things to notice very quickly. They obviously, these, these two families of argument have very, very strong backers. Uh, the state and the corporate sector have different reasons for backing them. As I say, they have different reasons for backing them both. Second thing to notice is that this, this broad um, organization of dissent or organization of debate, if you like, is found much more widely than in the media. It is echoed or paralleled in discussions of the economy, where in the mainstream you either have, you either have Keynes, who is the public servant par excellence, or you have Hayek, who is the great promoter of market forces. Uh, so, this organization of debate, if you like, has deep, deep roots uh, and is, is echoed much more widely. And the second thing I think is worth noting is, as it were, the poetry of these legitimations. In one of them, the state is an, is an arena of expertise and rationality. It's a, it's a realm of cold reason, okay? Uh, it's where Apollo lives. Um, and in the second family, you find the market, which is a chaos of individual choices, 
It's a kind of ecstatic realm where all things are permitted, uh, and it's, it's presiding God is Dionysus. Okay, so there's a kind of deep poetry, I think, to the ways in which these, I, these ideas are organized uh, more generally. Now, the, the approach that I take and that I argue for in more detail in The Return of the Public is essentially to, to make the case for a democratic organization of the media. Now, to put it in axiomatic terms, what I propose is this, that in a de democratic media system, each citizen has an equal power to direct the funds intended to support public interest journalism. Okay? It's a, it sounds like a fairly limited formula. Um, I'm arguing that each of us should have equal voice in how subsidies to support public interest journalism are distributed. So I'm talking about general participation in decisions about what becomes part of a society's shared body of knowledge, about what is and is not controversial, about what kinds of information can become politically significant. Now, when we think about this, when we start to think about the media in this, in this critical sense as, as, a, as a site for democratization, it's extremely important to emphasize the necessary role of the state. At the moment, any, sta any media system that works, works because of intervention by the state in the form of subsidies in particular. This state role is not normally discussed. No one has an interest in talking about the role of the state. Uh, in the way that media systems are organized. But when, when it is necessary, when there's no, no alternative but to mention the state, the justification of the state intervention will be made in terms of the public interest justification. It's in the public interest that we support journalism. It's in the public interest that we support public broadcasting. Now, it seems to me this gives you a powerful way in to an effort to democratize the media because Funds from general taxation or from subscription are being taken and they are being used to support the public good. Journalism as a public good is, is receiving public subsidies. Now, key question is, who gets to determine how those subsidies are distributed? This is the question that most people in power are desperate to keep from general deliberation. Um, so, the state is, the, is an indispensable player in creating and maintaining a national media system. It has a vital interest in sustaining a media system. To talk about a state in the absence of a national media system is to talk in contradictions. You cannot have state organization of society without a national media system. The news, in other words, is not just something that happens to happen, that follows behind uh, the reality of, the public, of, of, of political uh, uh, life, it is uh, integral to that political life uh, in any national system. We could reconfigure the state, uh, and, and particularly the, the state's role in creating the field of publicity. We could change what becomes widely known, and crucially we could change what becomes widely known to be widely known. So that we can we can make the state's role in this uh, in this uh, in its function. Uh, uh, both transparent and uh, based on participation. Now, there are practical questions about how you do this. I'm not the only one who's talking along these lines. Uh, Bob McChesney in the States uh, has made a proposal that we would have news vouchers. These would be, uh, these would be made, avail made available to each citizen on an equal basis, and each of us could decide to support one media outlet or another uh, on the basis of our, of our established preferences. Public commissioning, the, the, the proposal that I make is, is broadly similar. I'd be quite happy with a voucher system, frankly, uh, compared to what we have. But there are some uh, important minor differences in, 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 our, in our emphasis. Just to talk practically about what I propose in the return of the public, what I suggest is that we take a, a relatively modest amount of money, uh, a few hundred million pounds in my country, so a, a fraction of the BBC's budget, which is about 3.4 billion annually. We take some fraction of that money, 100 million, a couple hundred million, and we make it available to the citizenry to distribute to media projects that they wish to see supported. Uh, journalists and researchers, media outlets, publishers would make proposals about what they wanted to, to spend their time doing, 
and those proposals that secured sufficient levels of popular support uh, would then be put into production. So we would vote for projects uh, that we wanted to support. Proposals might be long-term, very extensive. They might look much more like a publishing operation in the, in the traditional sense. Or they might be short-term uh, and quite tightly focused on a particular issue, a particular possible story, a particular area of research, or a particular task. It's important to emphasize it's not just about funding investigations into, into new areas of knowledge. It could be about getting resources in order to coordinate uh, and to make different forms of analysis of existing information. I mean, part of the point in the digital sphere is that the information is there. There's a huge amount of information there, um, which could, be the, could form the basis for all kinds of radical critiques of society. But A, there, is, there's, there are very limited opportunities to turn that information into, into media or into uh, media products uh, that, that are comprehensible or accessible to mass audiences. And a second problem, um, of course, is that um, public commissioning would need some mechanism uh, by which uh, information and analysis that's developed found its way into the mainstream. It's not enough that we, we fund alternative media and then leave it somehow to magic for, this, for, for new information to find its way uh, into the mainstream. A couple of points to notice about what I'm saying. Um, what I'm precisely arguing for is some mechanism by which all of us can have some involvement in commissioning journalism. All of us are involved as co-producers uh, in journalism. Second point is I'm not arguing for uh, uh, reforms which are, are captured by some, some notion of a marketplace of ideas, um, whereby what becomes well known is subject to some emergent property uh, in, in public discourse. I think we should take seriously the notion that in a broadcast regime, for example, there are sites which assemble large audiences. And the battle is not just about refining our own understanding in parallel with and not in communication with others. Part of, of what effective reform must do is change the composition of, of mainstream publicity. And thirdly, what I'm proposing would be a kind of ongoing general education, not just about the objects of inquiry, but about our collective preferences. We would learn directly and regularly about what other people find to be um, important, what they think is a matter of urgent interest. You know, liberals like to say that education empowers, but power educates. The possession of a power to affect the public sphere, widely distributed, motivates inquiry amongst ourselves. Given, given this power, people will have conversations with one another at the most basic level about what they think is important, and they'll do so in the knowledge that these conversations matter that if a few hundred people decide that some development in their local community is important and deserves publicity, those few hundred people uh, can have some opportunity, essentially, to com commission media that reflects their concerns. And, so, and that scales up, obviously. Um, I don't know how I'm doing for time. Plenty of time. As a parenthesis, you know, as a, as a publisher, I would often be told in meetings we don't want, we, we're not going to do that because the public aren't interested in it, right? And what was interesting about that dismissal was that there was never any evidence for it. Or rather, or if there was evidence, the evidence was kind of ludicrously irrelevant. I was told that the public weren't interested in, uh, in offshore finance, in the corporate form, uh, in investigative journalism by people like Greg Pallast, by fo about people weren't interested in fast food, democracy in Europe, Basically, everything that I ever published or was involved in publishing a successful and popular book about, at some point in the process, I would have been told, probably by someone senior to me, that the public aren't interested in that. Right? Now, at the moment, those of you who work in the media will have been in those meetings, and you will probably have had the same thing said to you. The public aren't interested in that. If you do not have a system like something like what I'm proposing, you will always be subject 
to what seems to me to be an, an illegitimate form of internal restraint on your activities. You'll go into meetings, you say, I've got this extraordinary thing that's happening, and I w I'd, I'd like to spend some time looking at it. And your editor or somebody will say, public aren't interested in that. If, if you cannot reach out to the public to determine what they are interested in, you will always be at the mercy of that kind of constraint. So as I say, in a public commissioning system, we would be motivated uh, to, it, to persuade others that, that what we were concerned about was important, talking at the level of the citizens. And crucially, they would be motivated to talk to us. So, so this is not about imposing a superior understanding on a passive audience. This is about audiences discovering themselves as active participants in the creation of a public sphere. Okay. So th and th this causes tremendous opposition, but we can talk about, uh, a bit about this later. Okay, so what I'm suggesting is uh, the, that we all have some opportunity to, to affect, to influence the composition of the public sphere. As I say, that entails some careful consideration about what the public sphere is, obviously, where it is situated. It also requires us to think quite carefully about where the public sphere is to be found in, in the digital future. Um, to, to, to reiterate, this is a matter of deep contemporary concern for certainly the American state, certainly the British state, certainly for uh, Silicon Valley capitalism, for the cutting edge of capitalism. How are they going to reproduce the conditions of broadcast in, in the digital future? Okay, You're not seeing a circulation of executives from Google into the, uh, the NSA, the State Department, and back again by accident. This is not something that's just a coincidence. This is something that the Google and the State Department are working very closely together to figure out how to reassemble large audiences. Because without large audiences, as I say, the notion of national politics starts to look impossible. Okay, so I'm going to skip over that because I don't really think we need to I'll go into detail here, but, but what I would say is that there are practical questions about how you do this, and the process by which you get towards this, and hopefully we will, uh, we will engage with them. What I'm proposing at the outset is it could be quite a broad brush system. It could be qu the crucial thing is that we have some way to, to, to gain insights into what we're interested in uh, as publics at the moment outside uh, the forms of media production. But over time, this form of, uh, this way of organizing knowledge or organizing inquiry could extend much further, could go much deeper, it could go into the operations uh, of science, for example. Um, and it leaves open the question of how much people want to participate in this process. Some people might become um, busybody public editors who pour over proposals and pour over the results. Some people may be busy with other things until something occurs to them that they wish to engage with. I'm not suggesting that we all become citizen journalists. I'm st I'm st I still recognize the need for a division of labor. I still recognize the need for uh, certain forms of institutional memory in the media, forms of technical expertise. Uh, what I'm arguing against, though, is using those forms of technical expertise and those forms of institutional memories uh, of memory as a way of stifling legitimate debates about public interest, which I think is the danger uh, in the current circumstances. Now, hopefully some of you will have been uh, at, the, at the Commons, uh, discussion on the Commons yesterday. There are important parallels, I, hear, I think, between these two, uh, these two areas, the public sphere and the Commons. In a sense, what I'm arguing for is that we think of the public sphere as a Commons. That's to say, we think of the public sphere as being, uh, as being a zone in which those affected by decisions are able to determine the rules of governance uh, in, in a particular place. Um, what, you know, what, is the, what, what is produced in the media system? Information is produced. How do you keep that information both relevant and accurate? That comes down to the rules of governance. If you think of information, as it were, as a sustainable resource, 
It's subject to various kinds of pollution or various kinds of uh, over-exploitation. Um, and unless the people who are ultimately reliant on information, as to say the general population, unless they have some means into its operations, uh, they will be, I think, radically misinformed about matters of deep consequence. Um, I'll talk quickly about the implications of, of, of what I'm suggesting. Um, it, this isn't about pursuing a third way. This isn't about creating a, a special zone where different rules apply. If you start to allow the public into the commissioning process, if you allow daylight in on editorial decision making, you begin a process which will transform the state. It will have deep implications for the operations of the private media. And this is precisely why they don't want to talk about it. This is precisely why there has been almost complete silence about this notion. Okay, in the liberal left media, as much as uh, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the right wing media. If you want to make proposals for alternative economic models, if you want to talk about all manner of ecological or social issues, there are outlets that will publish this material. They will not publish material about democratic control of the media. Is that? Um, so, that, so yeah. So I would I would emphasise that we're not talking about we're not talking about a discrete form of reformism. We're talking about something with very broadly uh, transformative potential. Potential would would it would definitely affect the dynamics of uh, news production. The news would cease to be what a small number of professionals decided it was. Very bluntly, it would become something that was open uh, for genuine popular deliberation. Can I, yeah, so I'll very, very quick, very quickly um, wrap up. Two objections to this that are very common. First is to say the public just will just, in a system like this, the public will just want trivia. And the second is that in a system like this, we would see poisonous ideas uh, be, be gaining a public footing. Uh, there's a, I think there's a sort of ecological argument or response to both of them. Saying that the public will only want trivia and scandal is rather like saying, if you give people a forest and pasture and a lake and sea, they'll just chop down the trees and raise cattle and grow corn so they can eat hamburgers. Okay? What we end up with in the marketplace, what is popular, as to say the hamburger of media consumption, is the consequence of productive processes that we're not involved in. If you give ac access to the, the, the systems of production, to the people who end up consuming the product, you should not assume what they end up doing uh, is, is replicating uh, the same patterns of consumption that you have today. Um, and this is, a, this is an interesting objection which is often raised by left-wing liberals. I was at a meeting of, on media reform and someone said, if you, if you do this, they'll just want stories about Rihanna. Okay? So this is deeply upsetting and uh, unsettling um, to lots of people who think of themselves as being progressive. The other, the other objection, which I think has more force to it, is to say that this will give uh, uh, an opportunity for extremists and people with poisonous ideas, give them an opportunity to access the public sphere. There are a couple of responses to this. In my country, the system we have now gives ample opportunity to disgusting ideas to enter the public sphere. Okay? Our mainstream press is very hospitable uh, to ideas that are verging on the fascistic. Um, and I think this, and the, the second, as it were, e ecological response to this is to say that one of the problems we have with the current arrangements is that they can't deal with fantasy. They can't deal with, with pernicious forms of fiction. So the claims of fascism are as immune to refutation in our system as are the claims of advertisers. Right? Our system is, is dependent on fantasy and it dependent on, on the unchallengeability of fantasy in ways I think that this would genuinely challenge. Um, I've written some uh, final remarks, but I'm going to stop because I know that 
it's much more easy to talk than to just, yeah. So. Okay, then, uh, then thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, now I will uh, briefly uh, uh, present uh, the discussion the media working group uh, had. Uh, we took this um, kind of an o obvious notion uh, uh, as our uh, starting uh, point. I'm uh, talking about the insight that uh, there is a, a more or less um, significant uh, left turn in uh, mainstream media discourse. Uh, from the beginning of uh, the e economic crisis onwards. Uh, so uh, we can uh, see uh, more and more uh, e issues and uh, angles that co uh, co uh, couldn't have been uh, uh, imagined before the crisis. Uh, that there is writing on uh, um, uh, workers, uh, wor workers' strikes and so on and so on. Uh, but our uh, hypothesis is that uh, this, uh, this um, uh, le uh, let's call it left uh, turn, has its uh, uh, significant uh, structural limits. Uh, uh, good, uh, good and uh, perhaps symptomatic ex example of this is the situation in Slovenia, uh, where left uh, uh, discourse in mainstream became uh, more pertinent and visible and radical than anywhere in the Balkans uh, uh, during the last years, especially during the recent uh, protests um, and attempts to overthrow the Janez Janša's uh, government. Uh, what happened after the government was replaced is that the media uh, Im immediately softened their uh, discourse, although there they were um, a great amount of uh, journalists who, uh, who were uh, pretty, uh, let's say, class conscious and kind of a social vanguard and uh, who, who, who are uh, le uh, pretty uh, r radically left uh, oriented. Uh, editors managed to to like uh, soften things a bit after the the uh, government was uh, replaced. So uh, in a way, maybe uh, we could say I, I know that uh, Primoz from uh, from Slovenia had the, this uh, hypo hypothesis few few days ago, uh, talking on the uh, Le Monde Diplomatics panel, that in a way these uh, leftist uh, journalists and intellectuals were uh, kind of a uh, in instrumentalized uh, during during this uh, process. Um, well, just a second. So, uh, okay, we can see that the, this left turn is something that is uh, being used accordingly to the to the present uh, uh, context. Uh, the the main thing about this mainstream left turn, uh, um, I think, is that uh, uh, it it uh, its starting point is the critic uh, of the neoliberal capitalism, uh, but not the critic of the capitalism uh, as such. Uh, so uh, the, 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 there is always this idea that uh, the things got uh, uh, got wrong. I don't know from the beginning of of, of the crisis or uh, in a, in a more uh, a, a little bit more analytical uh, 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 journalist pieces from the uh, la late 70s uh, uh, onwards. But the, uh, the, there's uh, not the uh, s uh, systematic questioning of the capitalist uh, 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 capitalistic uh, um, uh, mode of uh, production as as, as such uh, now we, we we took this notion uh, as a starting point to to comment on uh, on present uh, and evident uh, media crisis uh, the media crisis is then being interpreted along this line uh, along these lines uh, so uh, uh, the cr uh, media went in, in, into a crisis with the beginning of the economic uh, crisis and the media crisis you know sacking of journalists uh, lower pay, uh, payments precarizations and uh, uh, all of that are just the effects of the of the uh, broader economic crisis uh, what are we proposing here is a little bit more uh, radical thesis that the media crisis uh, in uh, is is much more longer and uh, in the Balkans it began uh, with the restoration of capitalism in the early uh, 90s and with the privatization of the media. Uh, methodologically, we'll try to, uh, to show this uh, uh, thesis using the uh, basic uh, uh, tripartite uh, analytical differentiation of the media field, uh, dividing the media into uh, three, uh, three uh, groups or uh, fields or uh, sectors which are uh, which in the um, uh, 
okay, real life are uh, sometimes overlapping and uh, the um, uh, borders between them are uh, a little bit blurred. But analytically, uh, I believe that this, uh, this division is uh, quite useful. So the first sector is the commercial media sector, the second one is the public media sector, and the third one is this uh, fuzzy sector of uh, independent on, or uh, uh, you can call it alternative, non-profit, community, and so on and so forth media. I'll refer to it here as the third sector media because it's the most uh, neutral, uh, most neutral uh, uh, notion. So we are uh, using the commercial media as our uh, entry point. Uh, and we are here relying on the, the thesis of Robert McChesney, uh, American uh, media theoretician, uh, who has this uh, 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 his his um, theory is that the uh, media crisis uh, media crisis in the, the USA began in the early 70s with the, with the with the fall of the uh, profit when the profit rate uh, uh, fell. Uh, and uh, only after the, the, that uh, uh, the internet came along and, uh, and the current recession, which are uh, 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 the most popular ways how to explain the, the, the uh, media crisis. So, uh, in a way, from the beginning of the 70s, in, in the uh, McChesney's uh, uh, ways of explaining things, uh, media uh, got into this vicious uh, uh, circle, uh, sacking off journalists because of the uh, uh, profit ra uh, rate fell. Uh, when you have a smaller amount of journalists, of course, your content is uh, uh, your content, media content, uh, starts to shrink. Uh, accordingly to that, you're losing your audience, and so you're sacking more and more journalists. Uh, uh, just a second. Uh, uh, Okay, and this influence of uh, the, the influence of this uh, uh, profit-driven uh, media model uh, on the media content and the working conditions and uh, so on, uh, we think is even more visible in Balkan post-social countries, uh, thanks to this uh, uh, clear break between two uh, socio-economic systems uh, uh, at the late uh, 80s and early uh, 90s. Uh, so uh, we'll try to show uh, w uh, what happened uh, in uh, in that period. In uh, most of uh, of the countries uh, uh, which the uh, members of our groups uh, our group are coming for uh, from, uh, the uh, media usually became one of the first uh, capitalistic uh, enterprises. Uh, and there was this, uh, of course, this mantra of uh, uh, free market equals free media uh, uh, formula. That was the main ideological tool. Uh, at least three examples uh, show how the first part of this uh, formula, uh, the free market, uh, is incorrect. Uh, variety of media dependencies. Uh, the second one, the process of monopolization. And the third one, the fusion with other businesses. Uh, First one, uh, we have the situation uh, all over the Balkans of a great dependence of this uh, uh, so-called free, uh, free market media. Uh, now, in the uh, context of the economic crisis, they are asking the state for some kind of uh, bailout through uh, tax reductions and so on. Uh, they're also uh, tightly connect, uh, connected with uh, banks and hedge funds, uh, directly in uh, Montenegro, for example, and in Bulgaria, indirectly through some kind of credit lines in uh, other countries. Uh, they are tightly connected with uh, governments in Bulgaria and uh, partly in Croatia. Uh, they're uh, usually heavily dependent on uh, subsidies. Uh, we have this example uh, from Romania where uh, in the early 90s the, the press was uh, very influential because uh, the, um, uh, the paper was uh, uh, su subsidized by, by the state. And when the, when the state uh, stopped sub subsidizing the paper, uh, the, the press uh, lost its, its, uh, its influence. Uh, so there are a lot of examples of uh, how this uh, free market, uh, cl classical free, mar uh, free market uh, uh, mantra uh, uh, in practice doesn't work. Uh, the second example uh, of it is that uh, free market uh, model uh, produces as uh, anywhere uh, in the, in the uh, uh, capitalist uh, world produces uh, the configuration of oligopolies. Uh, we have, for example, in Romania, uh, the uh, three press uh, oligarchs uh, who are uh, uh, producing some kind of foxization of, of, of the media. Media are taking radical uh, right turn. Uh, 
uh, we have uh, the duopolis as in Croatia, uh, Croatian press, uh, and even the monopolis as in Montenegro, where the uh, VST, uh, the uh, the main publisher, uh, holds the monopoly over the over the uh, uh, press media. And uh, our third example, the process that uh, comes after the monopolization, uh, is a fusion with other businesses, uh, where uh, media power becomes not so much the source of direct profit, but the, uh, the tool in, uh, in ensuring the profitability of other ventures. For example, in Croatia, uh, press uh, is, uh, was uh, tightly connected with the building industry. And uh, when... Uh, building Is that correct? Yeah, building industry. Construction industry, yeah, construction, uh, construction industry, industry, and uh, when this uh, construction industry uh, collapsed at the beginning of the recession, it had severe effects uh, uh, back on the on the media uh, industry and media workers and so on. Uh, in uh, Bulgaria, uh, TV Bulgaria on air, the biggest private holding, is uh, connected with uh, chemical industry, and there are a lot of uh, local oligarch uh, entering the media uh, in uh, Romania and Bulgaria also. So uh, there are uh, also three examples. Uh -huh, th there are also uh, a little bit more examples of how the second part of this uh, free market equals free media uh, formula is incorrect. Uh, so we'll we'll uh, try to show how uh, the so-called market produces uh, unfree media uh, 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 content uh, uh, because the uh, free media means uh, only ownership of. Uh, Ownership freedom, not uh, journalist freedom, of course. And there, there you have this uh, uh, paradox uh, of the, the slender uh, legislation uh, uh, that is uh, still um, uh, in uh, still um, valid in uh, in, in uh, some countries uh, where the. Uh, uh, paradoxically, the owner is uh, free, but uh, the responsibility is left to the to the journalist. Okay, so a few of the examples of how the uh, free media uh, content is uh, is not so free as it is uh, 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 usually uh, said. We have this uh, uh, mechanism of uh, we called it PR outsourcing. Uh, so after the privatization at the beginning of the 90s, uh, when the managers came with the, their uh, profit-driven motivation and the uh, media became pri uh, private enterprises, uh, the labor costs uh, had to be reduced, of course. Uh, so you had the precarization, the professionalization, pauperization, and, uh, and uh, uh, all, those, all those effects on the uh, uh, labor force in media. Uh, and the journalists uh, uh, who, 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 who had uh, uh, m uh, much more uh, job to do and could not be that uh, specialized in uh, one or two fields as, as they used to be uh, before the, before the uh, new system, uh, simply had to rely on PR resources. Uh, uh, because you know you, you just don't have uh, enough time to to deal with uh, with the the story for I don't know two or three or five days, but you have to do it uh, in a couple of uh, hours and qui uh, quickly quickly move on. Uh, so uh, in a way, the uh, pol uh, the political uh, uh, impact on the media content. Uh, Came back to, through the back door through this uh, through this uh, uh, PR outsourcing, because the uh, journalists who are, uh, for for example, uh, writing something about the politics are relying on the on the uh, PR resources of the of the of the political parties and so on. Uh, something similar happened with the uh, so-called expert logic. The journal journalists simply have to rely on the opinion of uh, canonized experts because th they don't have time to investigate the story or uh, uh, lever the arguments or to special uh, in, in two or three uh, uh, fields. Uh, then you have this uh, process of uh, media producing its own uh, uh, content, uh, usually through the through the entertainment, where you have this some kind of uh, media created uh, 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 e event, and then that same media is reporting about that in event and so on, so on. And uh, the one of the one of the uh, probably uh, clearest example of the of the. Uh, uh, lack of freedom uh, in, in, in today's media uh, content uh, is uh, uh, that, uh, that, that we have a, a radically cl uh, class-biased media. Uh, they are uh, class-biased through uh, advertising because uh, poor people simply are not the target group of any product. Uh, then through the uh, product placement, uh, which is uh, uh, pretty... Uh, uh, 
pretty obvious in uh, examples in uh, Romania where you have this uh, kind of a public funding of the of the commercial media uh, which is like uh, uh, expecting of the commercial media to to, to produce some kind uh, kind of uh, of uh, content of a public interest for example ecological and and so on but then you have of course this uh, form of su subtle uh, co uh, commercialization of that uh, uh, content through the through the uh, product placement uh, and uh, the uh, third one uh, is uh, oh yeah this uh, great example of uh, the news feature from the shopping mall also from Romania thank you video uh, where you have the uh, kind of uh, feature in the news uh, from the shopping mall uh, and the news is uh, how the prices are low or high who is buying who is not buying something and and, and things like that so the examples of this class uh, class biasness of media can be uh, find uh, in uh, in uh, in a uh, uh, lot 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 of other uh, 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 media and countries as well. So I think we we get uh, pre, uh, uh, pretty thoroughly to, to, to uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, attempt to uh, deconstruct this uh, free market equals free media formula. And now we are moving from the commercial uh, commercial media to the, to the uh, public media. The main problem with the public media in most of uh, uh, our countries is that they are under the uh, uh, harsh influence of the commercial media. Uh, so the content of the, of the public media uh, uh, usually uh, perpetuate the uh, issues and, and angles of, 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 the, of the commercial media. Uh, we try to, to uh, explain this to the fact that there is the there same, is the same uh, uh, labor market, so you have the journalists in the uh, public media who who may be uh, tomorrow and or uh, in a, in a have to uh, find work in a, in a commercial media se uh, sector uh, and there, there there are also problems with this uh, professionalism uh, myth uh, of the journalism uh, where the balance and the neutral neutrality are required and uh, those features are of course uh, 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 very good tools in uh, reproducing any any dominant uh, uh, ideology. Um, so in Slovenia, for example, this uh, this uh, of, uh, falling of public media under the commercial media sector uh, influence uh, was tied to uh, led to the radical uh, m marginalizing of the public TV without any uh, serious uh, discussion. In Croatia, this p uh, paradigm uh, was c uh, questioned only uh, one year ago when. Uh, uh, the new uh, and uh, temporarily uh, uh, management yeah, of, thanks, uh, of the creation public TV uh, 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 came to, to uh, in lead of, of public television, okay, and so on and so on. Uh, uh, then also told us that in, in Britain there is a there is a resemblance situation that the BBC is is pretty under the influence of uh, of the uh, commercial media. So I'll just try to to uh, maybe m maybe skip on something because we are already uh, talking a little bit long. Uh, the key the key question of the public media, the question that uh, Dan Hind already addressed, is the question of financing and uh, independence. Uh, there are uh, a few ways of financing directly through uh, the from the state uh, budget which is usually dangerous uh, for the media independence uh, then the fee model uh, fee model uh, that uh, which is better for for the independence and can be also uh, made to be uh, austerity uh, proof uh, and the, the the third one uh, is the idea we, we, which is uh, uh, it, 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 it's uh, not realized anywhere uh, 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 up to date, but there is the idea of uh, taxing the telecommunication companies uh, because the, uh, they're the one who are squeezing the money from the from the internet. Um, okay, I'll skip this uh, the digression about the uh, internet uh, journalism because uh, then already. Uh, Told, told something about it. I, in, in any case, in this in this uh, central uh, question about the 
uh, finance the models of financing and deciding on how to finance the media. We are uh, 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 in, uh, large, largely in in favor of the of the public commissioning uh, model than I uh, presented uh, before. And uh, okay, the the third and the last uh, media sector, the third sector media or this uh, alternative and so on media, uh, they're they're quite interesting from the Balkans perspective because they're uh, exceptionally strong in post-socialist uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, they in a way exploded in the course of the last 10 or 15 years because, of course, of the broader political uh, context, uh, the funding of the of the uh, Western Foundation. Uh, uh, developing civil society and so on and so on. Uh, there, are a, uh, there are a lot of problems with this sector and it uh, sh shouldn't be idealized, idealized in any way. First of all, uh, it usually doesn't have uh, problems with uh, capitalism uh, at all and in, in that way it, 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 it uh, resembles the, uh, to, to this uh, uh, so-called left shift in um, mainstream media I was talking at the, be uh, at the beginning. Uh, it's uh, still very small also. In Croatia there are, uh, for example, 200 uh, people uh, working in the third sector media out of uh, 15,000 uh, working in, in, in the whole media uh, field. In Romania, uh, for example, it was uh, completely swept out during the crisis and so on and so on. Uh, then uh, it usually tends to be uh, self-sufficient. Uh, there are problems with the uh, uh, pro uh, project-oriented financing model because it shapes uh, content. Uh, uh, if you have, the, if you are financed through some kind of, I don't know, ecological uh, project, and you have this uh, small media, that there is a great uh, danger. Uh, uh, there is a danger that you you'll just start producing eco uh, 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 content that that is centered around these ecological issues and and, and so on. Uh, then there, there is the problem of, of with the leaning on, of, on uh, funds because uh, it, it, it make uh, the, f uh, uh, the fi financial finance financial model quite uh, vul vul vulnerable. Oh, well. <sighs> I have few more sentences. There is a problem with uh, self-exploitation, for example, at the uh, Radio Student uh, in, in Ljubljana and here in, uh, in, in Croatia we have the example of Zarez. I was a chief, uh, chief editor of Zarez for the course of last uh, three or four years. Uh, you have uh, usually a situation in the media sector where uh, third media sector people who are working for the media are working for free and the money is going somewhere else, for example, to distribution or press and so on. Uh, and uh, pro maybe the biggest problem is that this sector is underdefined. Uh, 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 perhaps uh, that's why there are uh, uh, so much uh, uh, labels for it. You know, this uh, alternative uh, third sector, uh, uh, non-profit, and so on uh, media. Uh, the questions are: Are we talking about the legal st uh, status of the publisher? Uh, are we talking about the content and how the, to define uh, define what's uh, what is the third sector uh, c content, what's not? Are we talking about the activism of that media and so on? Uh, we have two proposals for defining it. First one uh, would be the extension of the community media notion from the local communities, the political, uh, social, identity communities, uh, and so on. But there's uh, there's the problem that uh, th this kind of uh, definition becomes classless. Uh, of course, it it, it excludes the. Uh, uh, the primarity of the uh, of the class from the notion, and the second one is the combination of the non-profit motive on the one hand, and the set of some uh, abstract or consensual rules such as human uh, uh, rights uh, uh, on the other. However, and this is the last, uh, there are still uh, there are still the po uh, potential in this small but uh, pot uh, potentially influential media media sector. Uh, so, in uh, in a way, we are proposing a stronger public funding of, of, of the third sector media, uh, combined uh, maybe with the models such as uh, public uh, commissioning, uh, in, uh, in a way that it could provide uh, influences on public media sector. Uh, and so on, so on. Uh, in in any way, the the uh, main conclusion is that there are two two main goals uh, uh, the, of the 
uh, leftist uh, uh, activism about uh, about the media. One is to strengthen the working uh, uh, the working position of the of the media labor force. Uh, uh, because the uh, nowadays uh, union models, for example, don't don't know how to deal with the with the precarization. So uh, uh, the uh, one one way uh, uh, would be uh, probably to try to organize uh, precarious news workers and unemployed ones in some kind of uh, co co cooperatives, uh, uh, which then uh, could. Uh, Produce uh, uh, the the content and uh, sell it individually to the to the media, and the the other goal uh, would be the democratic control over the media content. Okay, so if 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 anything uh, was uh, uh, blurry or, or if I skipped anything uh, important, we could uh, get to this through the the discussions. All the participants of the group are, uh, are uh, of course. Uh, uh, in, 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 in the same position uh, as you and can uh, discuss and criticize all of this uh, as they will. Thank you. Let me break the ice. Um, question about Walter Lippmann. Uh, what I got, Walter Lippmann, the, the creation of uh, public opinion in US uh, post Second World War. I just wonder. Are there any authors, because you said that this is kind of hidden under the surface, the uh, uh, collusion of you know NSA and Google, so the, the, the secret services in the US who are trying to come up with mechanisms to, to, to you know produce all this data in some way which is for humans meaningful. So they, they try to create meaning for us out of the masses of information. Are there any authors that you've seen that are trying to theorize this in a kind of overall totality level in which Lippmann did flatly saying, you know, we will produce meaning and we will call freedom and democracy no matter what. Who cares what goes under the surface? As long as people believe it's freedom and democracy, we win. So in a way, because what I see, uh, uh, it does remind me that that kind of process is underway, but it seems far more sophistic sophisticated now, of course, because we are dealing with masses of information sources. So the question is, as the author, theorist, are you seeing any models, you know, are, or are they being really not open at all? Is this something you think just happens behind the closed doors, those discussions? I'll sacrifice. And actually, I have, a, I have a, a, not even a, a question, I think more of an intervention on this um, way of understanding media as uh, some sort of um, separated uh, realms, like this kind of, you know, you have the newspaper, you have the TV, you have the radio, you have the internet now, and all the problems associated with this kind of uh, media. Um, I think, uh, and I will tell you, from this experience of uh, our um, critic attack in uh, in uh, Romania, this uh, independent leftist platform, whatever, that uh, looking at media only in this way, I mean, it has a lot of uh, a lot of problems uh, in terms of theoretical uh, thinking, but that's probably irrelevant now. I I will uh, try to suggest why it's um, not interesting to look in these various uh, sp splits in in media. Um, what is interesting uh, to uh, understand, I think, is that it's not enough to have one uh, single um, uh, um, outlet, media outlet, that one controls even democratically or whatever, uh, non-hierarchically and so on, even well-funded, because it's, it's never uh, enough. And I'm not even uh, speaking about this uh, kind of access to more people and uh, uh, enlightening the masses, but from our exper experiences that you have uh, this kind of... Um, a platform uh, on which you can write text and uh, somehow create your own uh, readership, which was pretty successful with zero money, basically for a year and a half. But what we realized very soon is that uh, basically you become locked into some sort of uh, uh, ghetto of your own. I mean, from all the uh, perspectives that you usually refer to media, our case was somehow perfect because it was like really democratically organized, uh, not subordinated to any form of... Um, corporation, uh, capital, or whatever. Uh, and with our own readership, whatever we wanted to bring uh, theory uh, and so on. But then we realized, oh, but this is a small ghetto uh, we just created. Because we had no, uh, no access to uh, other forms of uh, communication in order to enlarge this. And I think the real question here would be how to more 
systems, uh, and I don't, I don't need all the standard media for, to follow up with some sort of um, meetings face to face or uh, conferences or uh, I don't know maybe uh, radio or whatever. I mean, diversify this kind of uh, understanding of what the media is and how the public comes into uh, being. And I think that would be uh, really the, the challenge to somehow uh, offer a, a broader platform for um, for this. Those two. Um, I mean, the question was asked about uh, whether there are theorists like Walter Lippmann who are, as it were, reassembling uh, uh, an account of how the media system should work in order to, to maintain elite dominance. I mean, that's that's Lippmann's project. Uh, he associates elite control with rationality, associates democracy with chaos. His great opinion in the 30s and 20s is, uh, is Dewey, John Dewey. And one of the, one of the interesting characteristics in Dewey's thought is this emphasis on face to face meeting as, as a medium. So when you say that we need to think much more carefully about what we mean by uh, the media, I think you're absolutely right. The, you know, one, of the, one of the great media events in recent years was the Occupy movement, where you had people talking uh, and using face to face meetings. Not only for their own sake, but also for the spectacular impact they might have elsewhere. Um, so, uh, so I'm very, very sympathetic to the idea of, of being very careful about what we mean by media. And I think the, the issue of characterization connects neatly with this reconfiguring of control. Um, if we leave things to run on the course they seem to be on at the moment, we're heading for a kind of digital future where you'll have plenty of opportunities to network with people like you. Radicals will have plenty of opportunities to share radical ideas and analysis, make, make radical forays and various kinds. It will be quite easy to overlook the fact that you're just talking to yourselves. We're just talking to ourselves. And that the great broad mainstream continues to operate according to dynamics that we don't control and crucially that we don't understand. I mean, there's this, this fact that the magic is in the algorithms. So what becomes prominent on YouTube, what becomes prominent on Google searches, is the end product of a process we have no insight into. And there's an interesting sense in which raison d'etat, that's to say elite control is configured in the state, overlaps with business models, okay? Because the state wants to be able to intervene in the operations of Google or Twitter or YouTube or whatever in ways that are invisible. Google, YouTube, and so on, they don't want to talk about the algorithms. The algorithms is where the money is made, right? They want to talk about how we can all share pictures of cats. Uh, we can all like things, right? There's this sort of, the exoteric content of these networks is what we're encouraged to focus on, because that's where we express ourselves. It's where we divulge commercially useful information about ourselves, okay? But in the esoteric workings of these, these giant networks, not only do you have the opportunity to generate super profits, but the state has, has the opportunity to interpose its agenda without anyone being aware of it. So that the state's agenda in future, in the future could become, uh, as it is now in the broadcast regime, just what's on the news, right? It's just like the natural consequence of what reasonable people think. Your question, is there a modern Lippmann? Is there a, I, I, as it stands, I don't, I don't I wouldn't single out a, an author and say there's where the action is happening. Um, it's not like uh, the early 90s where I think you can say that Huntington and Fukuyama together are kind of presenting a kind of dual account from the elites about how the post-Soviet future should be organized. Uh, I don't think there are people who are kind of that, that prominent as, as it were, public intellectuals. Um, it's a very interesting question whether I'm just wrong, maybe there are people who, who qualify in that sense. Um, and I'd be fascinated, fascinated to hear if, if people think there are candidates. Um, but if there isn't, then that's, that itself is quite informative about how this is going uh, and how this is, being, how this is being managed to the extent that it can be managed. Because I, I think it's important to emphasize that nothing is inevitable in this. Um, and we shouldn't think that, uh, that the, the, the taming of digital, if you like, is, is, is an inevitability. Okay. 
I have a question or comment that I wanted to relate this notion, uh, definition of public interest and the political subject behind these reforms you are, uh, because you know we are having now these debates in Croatia about how the media reforms and all that stuff, and now there is this question what is public interest, there are also some interpretations that the public interest is defined by, by law or something like that, but the, the question, the question is not be trapped in this Habermasian liberal definition of public sphere and uh, public interest, to acknowledge that public interest is the outcome of political struggles, it's kind of antagonism, it's said by the law. You know, I can say that public, uh, for me the public interest is socialization of the means of production, is that public interest? So it's kind of really political to some uh, historical, uh, 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 historical definition of, of uh, uh, public uh, public interest, so it's really hard to, especially in Croatia, in the, these, for example, these two guys are trying to introduce these media reforms, and because they don't have any kind of political support, they are not a political subject, they can say, okay, this is our definition of public interest, and we'll go there. They all, always have to legitimize it from the, some kind of, you know, a historical figure of public interest who no one knows what it is, or we, we know some uh, things, but it's really difficult. I think it's really uh, needed to connect the balance of political and social forces with the, with the definition of what the public uh, public interest is, the, because there is no any kind of uh, abstract uh, historical uh, definition. Again, can I just? Sorry, just Okay, so uh, I would like to continue uh, on what Marcos said and, uh, and uh, speak more about uh, the uh, social context and the problems uh, of the left uh, when, uh, of, the, of the left and the media in Croatia. Not about left media in Croatia, but about uh, uh, what happens when the left uh, articulation of any kind of social or political problem enters the media. And uh, um, I think that this is something that the whole region uh, uh, has a problem with. I think that the past 20 years uh, have been uh, have played a crucial role. The restoration of capitalism and uh, and the tabuization of communism has played a crucial role in uh, in uh, uh, in the uh, problem of of, um, of uh, uh, articulation of the left position in the media. So uh, uh, of course that. Um, that uh, uh, um, the way me, me, uh, media function is a uh, uh, is a crucial question, and of course that the, the large privatizations of the media in Croatia played a crucial role for the um, for the uh, shift of interest in topics to to uh, typical watchdog positions and so on. But there's also another problem, and that is the problem of. Uh, of the uh, journalist perspective of, of the media field. And that is the, the middle class position of the people who find themselves to be uh, uh, um, public, public opinion creators, who uh, un, uh, reject their position as a worker, and uh, who refuse to accept that they are uh, 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 workers in a machine that is not uh, revolving around their, their a personal opinion of what public opinion is, but uh, on the fact that the owners of the privately owned media have to make some money. So uh, these two problems and have converged in Croatian media uh, in a manner that that uh, it causes a, a extra and um, uh, uh, additional antagonism that is not really uh, necessary, but it is here and it is real. And uh, one of the problems that we, uh, people dealing with media in Croatia, still haven't uh, uh, dealt with is this uh, anta antagonism of the journalists when trying to, uh, trying to articulate um, um, all this in, uh, with them. It cannot be said without, uh, without uh, a strong antagonism on their side. So I don't know, uh, I know that uh, I've been talking uh, about these topics with people from Serbia and I think that maybe this forum, considering how it's a Balkan forum, should be more focused not on theoretical questions but on, uh, on, uh, on uh, uh, problems uh, of the, that we have in the Balkans with the media. Because I think that uh, uh, gaining some, uh, some um, uh, legitimization through media uh, for the left is of a crucial question because it is one of the uh, best ways to approach all sorts of uh, social strata. OK, 
Okay, so I would uh, something slightly different. So the, the question of media education, concretely, I mean. Uh, this question of different interests and, uh, and all of that is fine, but uh, if if we were we were to deal with the way how uh, how how media framing of certain issues is uh, posited, so what is the focus, what is the angle, um, then I think that uh, the media education of journalists is uh, certainly on the agenda, and, and I don't think we can do it only in the media itself. I I think it's a uh, wider uh, engagement uh, uh, because concretely I have an example here uh, most of you from Croatia probably re remember this the, when uh, our uh, uh, the politician that was uh, supposed to go to the European Parliament Ingrid Antičević Marinović had uh, like a gaffe she uh, her her English was not very well, and uh, uh, she, uh, uh, according to the media and the public, made a uh, made an embarrassment of herself in the in the Euro Parliament. And uh, practically, I think all of the media from all three sectors made an emphasis precisely on that uh, uh, um, rhetoric. So her English was not bad. She was not a good. Uh, uh, um, she. She, she was not got a good speaker, but uh, what was interesting that the uh, content of that speech, I don't think I saw it, I'm, I may have missed it, but I don't think I saw it anywhere analyzed and, and concretely what she was talking about was that uh, we need to preserve, aug augment uh, our, our social welfare state. So, okay, so she is from the, the Social Democratic Party. I don't believe that she is a true Social Democrat. I, I think in something more rather, rather naive, but uh, but nobody in the media really problematized the content, only the patina, only the surface. No, just very, very briefly because I remembered uh, I had two points, but I forgot uh, the second one, so I started to uh, uh, engage again. But I, I was remembered when I heard the previous uh, intervention about the relationship uh, between left and uh, mainstream media and so on, and how it would be. This is something that always uh, comes up uh, in uh, the leftist circles, uh, at least the ones that I know, is that, oh, if we'd only be more reflected in the media, if we only had some sort of access, then we can convince more people and things will be better and so on. And I would like to suggest that maybe we should take the different uh, position and say that we shouldn't care about the mainstream media because I think it's only not natural for bourgeois, middle-class uh, uh, media not to care about the left and uh, have their own agenda. I think our uh, ambition should be, you know, to absolutely get rid of uh, uh, that media together with the capitalism that creates uh, uh, them. So for me, the caution, I'm almost like in this pure... Um, um, uh, term, terms of um, uh, in, in Gramscian terms would be, of course, for any leftist to aim at um, developing a parallel and uh, alternative uh, social uh, sphere and social media, including here also you know the newspapers, whatever, but also larger um, larger things like uh, something bordering the uh, everyday life in a sense. So I, for for me, the, as a as a leftist, I think the the question about uh, accessing uh, the mainstream media, blah, blah, I think it's, uh, it's a non-issue. Yeah, maybe similar. Uh, I think that uh, we, we should not have uh, trying to, to find a place in uh, media which are uh, our enemies in a way, but to, but to use, uh, to use uh, the media in a way how uh, capitalists use the media for profit to use and at the same way media for uh, our struggle to to for example uh, there is uh, everybody knows about that uh, newspaper 24 hours which uh, everybody can get for free to create uh, the uh, for example one paper like that which everybody can uh, get uh, every day and uh, discuss will start uh, in public. And uh, 
maybe it's possible to do it uh, in whole region at the same time uh, with uh, experiences, uh, personal experiences, experiences of workers, experiences of people who don't get their payments uh, for years, etc., etc. I just want a short comment on uh, this example with the Croatian member of European Parliament. Uh, actually, there was in Novelist uh, one column that was written how it's a very classical example of uh, stupidity and spins of Croatian media because it was a, a classical spectacularization of nothing. Uh, while in, in fact there are uh, several, there are named several examples of uh, German members of European Parliament who don't speak English at all and uh, I'm quite sure the Croatian media wouldn't uh, be that brave to mock the German MPs for uh, not speaking uh, English. And uh, yeah, I mean just about this thing about uh, should we take over the private media or uh, no. Uh, if we look the if you look the number of the examples which are uh, being sold by the main uh, the two main Croatian uh, uh, daily newspapers, uh, well, they are making uh, quite a good job of destroying themselves. Like the n numbers are dramatically falling, so maybe that issue will be a non-issue in a quite short time. Okay, so so I'll try to answer uh, in in a way. We'll have another another, another round. Uh, I'll try to answer in a way uh, to to yours and 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 yours uh, question. So the 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 comment on how we should uh, ignore uh, mainstream media and the proposal on uh, how we should try to 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 do some uh, kind of. Uh, 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 things that the capitalist media already do, but uh, from a non non profit media, I think that the uh, the question is not uh, uh, the question of uh, how the mainstream media are uh, uh, picturing the the, the left. Uh, this picture will will, will always uh, be be distorted uh, in a way, uh, or uh, uh, will uh, be turned in, in uh, some kind, you know, of, of a caricature or, or or something like that. But the uh, the, the the main uh, uh, issue on on mainstream media is the issue of uh, financing them. So I think we should be uh, uh, we shouldn't ignore mainstream media when it comes to the question of uh, uh, in what way are they financed. Uh, uh, yeah, are are the tax uh, taxes uh, uh, low? Uh, are the taxes high? Uh, and, and and so on and so on, um, yeah, because the that question of financing uh, 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 always turns up when you try, for example, to 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 do something like uh, 24 hours and uh, uh, get this uh, uh, free examples uh, every day. Uh, since I was a uh, chief editor of uh, uh, printed uh, biweekly, uh, the the uh, expenses of the press and distribution are tremendous. You, you cannot do that. It's a good idea, but it, it, it needs... You, you can't even imagine how much money would, it, uh, would you need to, uh, I don't know, uh, dis distribute uh, some kind of a free daily through, throughout the whole uh, uh, Balkans. So, that okay. It's a it's a it's a it's a good proposal. I would like to have that kind of uh, of uh, of a daily, but I think uh, that uh, the the thing uh, we in this group try to concentrate is the is the problem of uh, funding and financing uh, the the media, not not so much the media uh, representation. Uh, yeah, I'd like to follow up on uh, this idea. You know that we should. Um, abandon uh, the mainstream media. I would agree with that if there were a million people outside waiting to leap into action and destroy capitalism. But the sad fact is there aren't. There is nobody outside. So the question is, how do we, do we get them? Uh, and it's natural for media to be bourgeois just like it is for any sphere of production to be bourgeois, like it is for the state to be bourgeois. 
uh, if you use that criterion, there is no way to fight it. Uh, and there's also no way to win a battle if you don't even show up uh, to the battlefield. So this, uh, uh, since media have uh, immense influence, um, we should take them as a sphere uh, of battle. Um, and also, uh, if you look at um, media, uh, discourse about media and also the way uh, media is researched, it is, uh, we always talk about the media as a sort of uh, monolithic entity and uh, the fact that it is a sphere of production, that there is a labor going on there and th there are also uh, labor conflicts uh, is most of the time uh, ignored. So um, how we manage to get in the media, in the mainstream media, the, uh, with the Initiative for Democratic Socialism in, is, in Slovenia, is exactly by uh, going to journalists. They are precarious. They, they understand what's going on. They sympathize with the idea of uh, socialism exactly because they are workers. They know they are workers, uh, and they identify with this position, and they are interested to push this position even when editors uh, are opposed uh, to it. They, they try to find ways around the media. Uh, so, for example, the, great, uh, the daily newspaper with this... Uh, so, the, the serious daily, new, the political daily newspaper with the highest circulation, there the journalist uh, made this project, they call it uh, Revolt and uh, Alternatives to get uh, alternative left-wing critical voices into you know, the, the most read pieces of the newspaper. Uh, they prepared the project and they brought it uh, to the editor uh, a few minutes before the decision had to be made. So the editor had no choice. So they're finding um, interesting ways. Um, and regarding uh, uh, that what you said, so uh, the role of uh, journalism and professionalism, uh, I think it's important to stress that historically the idea of professionalism and the process of uh, professionalization was not something that was uh, fought for, for by news workers. It was something that was thought up uh, by the owners. So on the one side to get consent of the workers uh, in the media and for, to dissociate them from the working class. So now all of a sudden you're no longer working class, you're a professional. Uh, you're something higher, your work is not really work, it is creative and so on, and you have nothing in common with the common rebel uh, outside. So uh, when we look at these processes today, the processes that are uh, happening, the deprofessionalization, the pauperization uh, of journalism, uh, it's important to fight them on a different field, so uh, to avoid going back to that model, you know, that historical model that, oh, now you know, journalism is, uh, journalists are becoming uh, pauperized and we need to go back, but to create, use this process as an entry point uh, to connect uh, the wider struggles of the working class uh, with the struggles of uh, news workers. Yeah, briefly, I just wanna like, yeah, pick up a little bit. Um, and of course, I, I speak from the experience of independent media, right, from indie, uh, indie media to critic attack. And um, I, I want to emphasize that uh, uh, with this point of not bothering about mainstream, that does not mean not intervening both in the mainstream media and in the public sphere. Not doesn't mean at all. It means that, uh, say, let's say, at least from the independent media, um, this is a place in which we developed a consciousness. It's a sort of an ideal place to work, at least in terms of content, and that this particular autonomy and ideal state of things is uh, something that we even have the duty of uh, uh, confronting mainstream media and uh, uh, telling them that uh, what we are doing. Because this is not a peaceful, I mean, this separation between the three sectors is just a pedagogical tool. It's a very useful pedagogical tool. The historical reality is that mainstream media and the uh, commercial media and the public health sector has, in the history of transition, uh, repressed, ignored, or reduced to silence independent media so that uh, it is important for us to claim our victories and to state our autonomy and this not bothering the mainstream. And um, um, for instance, and this links me to, to uh, for instance, the victory, one of the victories, let's say, is uh, not only in relation to mainstream media, but also to academics. Uh, 
to the university, right? So looking at the, the public sphere in all kinds of transversal ways that reflect both our upbringing, our work, our uh, work relation, our friendship relation, all kinds of these things. And uh, uh, one of the victories is against the, the uh, deconstruction and uh, uh, transformation of uh, anti-communist ideology in, uh, from uh, a monolithic ideological bloc to which every, the whole society has been subjected, education system, public of mainstream media, journalists, and so on, to an object of uh, contestation. The same, the transformation of the usage of words through semantic interventions, namely the victory that we claim uh, from, uh, uh, in the usage of the word capitalism instead of free market, right? Uh, and so on and so forth. So, these are uh, uh, things that from the experience of, indie media, uh, of independent media we bring to the table of, uh, let's say, the general uh, fields of expression or, or, or production of content. And in, in the same way, we also bring a new way of relating, or a different way, that may, it may not necessarily be new actually, a different way of relating to the, or creating a public, or dis discovering public. It's not that we know who our public is, sometimes we have no idea. Uh, there's the case with the, uh, uh, in our case, with, a, with an article that uh, we received, it was an interview with a worker, to a company that is a sort of a Romanian equivalent of Amazon. And that piece that we never expected would have mattered uh, exploded and became uh, uh, the most important piece. And it created, uh, it brought after it uh, a complete new public as well as a new, and to which we responded with a new genre of pieces. And uh, mainstream media came on to us uh, after that, right? And so, I think it's important to emphasize this point of independent media because from the particular experience of uh, 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 Eastern Europe after uh, 89, after the regime change, uh, I think it, it has to be emphasized again and again that the independent media and generally uh, is, is, is a place of resistance and a place of struggle where you had uh, uh, not only a place of expression or, or job or where you had, for instance, uh, we can, uh, for instance, talk about the uh, two waves, big waves of uh, independent uh, journalism. Um, the first one, let's say, with, uh, in the, uh, when you had, uh, in the same time, emerging in uh, Slovenia, Rearticulatia, uh, Prelom, uh, uh, Idea in Romania, the, what else? There were a lot of them. Zares, maybe. Stodielat in Russia, around the same time. And now we have a second wave, a completely different wave. We have critic attack in Romania. We have commons in Ukraine, right? We have new left perspectives in, in Bulgaria. Well, you know. But there's a total, uh, clearly that there's a new wave. And so there's a consistency there in, the, in, the, in an autonomous history that simply needs to be taken into consideration for its own force then that we claim, definitely claim. And with which we try to develop leftists of, about which we'll talk later. <laughs> but that was it. Hello. Because, I mean, Ovidio already mentioned it, and I, I think if we leave it till the end, like it, we'll never speak about it. And also, I think there was an interesting point made there about the kind of uh, Balkan white newspaper in a sense that I think we shouldn't leave that easy. I mean, we, we just had it, you know, like when, when this was commented, we were saying, you know, say Metro. You know, these kind of publications that, you know, go every day, they're free. You know, um, they don't need to have new content. Like you, you have the same paper read for a week or more. Like it can be the same thing, and it doesn't have to be only with local content. It can be with you know things, for example, that we, uh, you know, publish in it, like translate into each language, coming from different you know Balkan countries. But you know, it it should somehow you know be just one of the things that could be available, but could be something that comes out of this, you know, so particular setting. We can try it, and and I think. Okay, I mean, yeah, sure, it's very expensive, and you know, we're not speaking about daily, we're not speaking about, you know, nationwide, we can speak about, you know, only capital cities, only, you know, something that can be covered on public transport. I mean, we, we get, so a lot of the funding that comes from the foundations that we are funded from goes for 
um, you know, things like, I don't know, handouts, leaflets, uh, posters and stuff that, you know, like we put in universities and there they are. And, you know, no, basically the, the attention that they draw is minimal, you know, because anyway, people from these places would come from internet and, and you know, Facebook and stuff. So why not use this money for, I mean, I, I'm not, I don't want to go into the... Yeah, and, and then where do we get content with? And so that there is where I'm, you know, jumping on the last point of of video. So we already have said after one of the left-wing forums that happened in Bucharest, uh, and as a follow-up also to a, to a kind of summer school in um, uh, Budapest, uh, like a English language web portal that has the ambition of being something like Eurozine or open democracy or counterpunch if you want it. It is on the website of um, Critic Attack, but it has a separate, uh, kind, it is a separate English language unit. And I think like what we should do, like just, you know, it, it's very easy, you write to us, like you write directly there. Uh, these things that you have already written in your own press, like translate into English, and get content from there, which is in English about other countries, and make it translate. I had an article about the Bulgarian, you know, um, protest, which got translated. I don't want to, you know, I think it was seven languages for one week, you know, all around the region. You know, it was Polish, it was Czech, it was, uh, you know, uh, Romanian, and so forth. So. Uh, actually in Romanian, <laughs> no, because it, it was published in English there. But anyway, I mean, what, what the point is, the point is content is out there, you can take it, you can relate to what is relevant for your own audience. And, and it is also a good place for us to exchange, but we don't need to keep it there. We don't need to make a new kind of, you know, fancy uh, online zine. It's just a place where content could be easily visible, shareable, translatable, open source, you know, like, you name it. So, like, it is criticattack.ro left slash leftist, but we can also leave some kind of leaflets about it. And, you know, like, this is one thing I, I just want to, to share. And, and I really think it should have some of this content into a printed version that we can distribute, you know, in, in our context and so I think that's on. Uh, I'm going to get, sound a little bit panicky because I'm worried I'm going to leave without, without saying this. I think this point about the relationship between the broad left, the social movements, and the mainstream media uh, is absolutely crucial. I think that the, uh, the, the cultural dynamics that you find within the mainstream media are absolutely crucial. This notion that, ju that journalists and editors in particular, particular editors have, that they're not workers, that they are professionals in some sense. This is a very old notion, and it goes back to Walter Lippmann's reconstruction of the American uh, national system on, on British lines, interestingly. Uh, Jay Hobson was writing about the Boer War, and he ran into uh, j editors saying, look, no one tells me what to write. No one tells me what articles to commission. To which Hobson's reply was, well, if you commissioned different articles, you wouldn't be in the job, right? That is the brute reality. So we're always going to come across this dynamic of people who hold privileged position in the, in the systems of production, who, who cannot see their position in the system of production, and they're not being able to see it as part of why they occupy that position, okay? So that is a, that is a given. The idea that the, 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 the left should ignore the mainstream, I think, is profoundly mistaken. Um, and and it, this goes at the level of media reform, and I'll tell you why. Everybody who is fighting for some progressive cause, if they fight that for that progressive cause without ch changing the media system, they are likely to lose, okay? So whether you're fighting to defend the environment, to promote social justice, to promote a post-capitalist economy, if you, if you in, in reality, okay, you'll use the alternative media that are available to you, but you'll also try and get coverage in the mainstream. That's the reality. Anyone who is involved in radical politics in my country is dying to get an article published in The Guardian, okay? They want to be in the mainstream because they know that's where the audiences are. Similarly, if you leave media reform to media reformers, if you leave it to a handful of people like me who are talking about democratic media, media reform will fail. The mainstream will not be reformed. And the, t 
by all means, play the game. By all means, try and get coverage in the system as it exists. But understand that the game is played in a certain kind of way, that there are certain kinds of rules. And those rules can be changed. And they are vulnerable at the moment, because, precisely as Boris says, because they're looking for subsidies. In my country, they published a report at the end of the, the Labour regime called Digital Britain, which quietly suggested that £125 million a year be given to large media conglomerates to sustain local and regional news. This was a direct subsidy to the corporate sector from public funds, right? They are looking for ways of taking public money and giving it to profit-seeking enterprises. If the left doesn't understand this process and intervene and say, this money is public money, it should be subject to public direction, then the money will go to corporations. They have the lobbyists. They control the discussion. Okay, so I don't care what your fight is. I don't care who you think your enemies are. I don't, uh, the details of what you're, you're, you're pursuing are one thing. But your chances of success will be determined by the nature of the mainstream media system. Uh, I, I cannot emphasize that enough. Um, and I take the point about this means giving resources to our opponents. Our opponents already have all the resources. Okay, and in the end, the reason why I'm on the left is not because it feels nice, but because I think that our arguments are better and our account of reality is more accurate. It's my belief that in a reformed media system, we will win. So that, that I maybe peaked too soon because we've got 10 more minutes, but that was my, that was my rousing peroration. At least I've got it out of my system. So Now, yo, <laughs> uh, I think the uh, difficulty is not to produce, in, in, in our times, it's not to produce some media. As we sit here, we can uh, produce three daily newspapers. We can run uh, four or five radio stations. We can make perhaps one television station. I'm sure about it, but the, 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 the problem is uh, the, 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 what, what do we want with the media? Uh, how we, uh, we can make a distribution? It's, 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 it's no uh, useless to produce uh, one newspaper with very uh, important uh, in, uh, uh, things in it. We are convinced that they are very important. And then there is a, a, a truck full of newspapers standing around somewhere and nobody thinks that he should read it. So it is necessary for his daily struggle. And this is the main problem, I think. How can we take this media we are capable to produce and we can link to some uh, ja, Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung and Heinrich Böll Stiftung to get some uh, 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 financial uh, support. But the main, uh, the main thing, we have to be read by the people. They have to, we have to manage uh, that they are interested in it. And therefore we have, we have to compete in a little bit, uh, in a little way, uh, what the mainstream media do. Uh, to, 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 to produce some uh, things which are interesting for the people. And they want to have fun, <laughs> they want uh, out of the media. And we have to produce it too, I think. Uh, j just a question uh, for Dan. I, I agree with your uh, analysis of the role of the mainstream and how the left should treat. But just if you can comment on the example of Venezuela, where the most of the media are in the hands of the uh, of the opposition. Okay, you can say they had the oil, but most of the media 
only one television and most uh, the most relevant uh, newspapers and televisions and the web portals are, are in the hands of opposition and they are really uh, pushing it hard uh, there so they are the only way except this you know it's, it's, it's not uh, because the Chavez was crazy that he was talking for 10 hours on one day but because of there is no other way to uh, communicate and only all these uh, community medias in the neighborhood in the neighborhoods in Caracas are the some kind of response uh, from that. So, so I think that the Venezuela is an interesting example in this, uh, from this perspective we are talking about. Um, can I very quickly come in on this? Yeah, I mean, I think this, this issue about competing in a, in a mainstream media system uh, is related to the question. Oh, um, maybe, I, maybe I'm, I'm going to keep, Milan, I think you should speak. Um, the, the, the issue of competing in a mainstream media market is related to the issue of Venezuela. Like, how do you, how do you develop charisma for progressive ideas? How do you make ideas seem relevant? Uh, the, 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 the solution that, that Chavez found in Venezuela was charismatic leadership. He would, he would stand and he would be charming and he'd be funny for hours and end to try and counteract uh, a, a capitalist media which was, was very strongly ranged against him. I mean, I would argue for the charisma, as it were, of the method. If you start to involve people in the creation of the public sphere, if people have some, some purchase on how the public sphere is constituted, how it's created, that process itself makes what's produced seem more relevant to people. They want to know what other people are interested in. I mean, the celebrity media is driven by our curiosity about each other. Right? But we're not just interested in who does what to who in the realm of celebrity. Right? We're interested in what people are interested in. We're interested in our disagreements. We find each other interesting. And this process of co-production in the media, I think, is part of how you solve this problem of the unsold newspapers. Right? You're right. We, the production problem isn't so acute as it once was. It's, a, it's acquiring attention for what you produce. And so I think it's, this is partly about taking into account the constitution of, of public service or state-controlled media. It's partly about taking, taking account of the public subsidies for the media. Um, but I, as I say, the, I think the charisma is also in the method. Um, and, and I'm gonna stop now. Yeah, uh, yeah. I will go, not go into details uh, about uh, several different uh, media reform models that are going on all over the world, uh, uh, such a corporate model uh, concerned mostly uh, uh, with the uh, issues of uh, corporate control of the uh, commercial media uh, on the internet, uh, or, uh, or those media reforms uh, concerned more with the ethical and individual aspects of professional journalism, uh, such a one uh, uh, in in the Britain uh, uh, moved by Leveson report recently. Uh, I will focus uh, on a, 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 a sort of a radical transformative media reform models we were we were trying to comment here on, such as uh, Bob McChesney's and free press model from from the United States, or then Heinz model of public commissioning. Uh, what is important about these models that they are not directed. Uh, to changing the media, uh, the media uh, uh, for the sake of changing the media, uh, but these uh, reform models are uh, are directed to changing the media for the sake of changing the society, and that uh, that's very important historical lesson that that there is no. Uh, a single example of, of a successful intervention into into uh, uh, media system of power, of power which neglected that wider transformative horizon. We cannot accept simply uh, simply the proposition that market is fine elsewhere, but not in the media. We cannot accept the ideas that precarization of labor uh, is fine elsewhere, but not in the newsroom. We cannot accept the idea that uh, uh, economic democracy is something needed for the, uh, for the uh, journalist's free, ex free expression, but something we don't care about elsewhere. So, uh, if we are talking about a uh, reform model uh, which would like to change the media 
uh, because it wants to change the society, uh, then we are talking uh, about not, not just uh, uh, about accepting uh, the concept of public sphere, but uh, also about uh, transforming the public sphere itself. Uh, from the liberal public sphere, uh, from the public sphere uh, that consists of participants which are citizens and the owners, into public sphere, uh, which is, as, as Habermas himself tried to revive, to derive from early Marx writing uh, of a public sphere, which, uh, which will be the uh, uh, meeting place of uh, citizens uh, uh, and uh, men and women. Okay, so thank you all for your attention. Uh, then thanks a lot. Uh, thanks to uh, all the people from the uh, working group. Uh, I, 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 I strongly believe that this is really the initial step in uh, trying to discuss uh, the media uh, in a Balkan uh, context and trying to do something about the media in Balkan context. And now a word from our sponsor. Just to two seconds just for a closure but we you need a, a stronger applause actually thank you thank you for for your work now um, three coordinators out of four uh, will close this uh, Balkan forum um, uh, I would like to say, um, to thank uh, Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. They've been very patient with our ideas, some of them very wild, very ambitious, some of them unrealistic, some realistic. Uh, I think we, we uh, uh, obviously, v v via, yeah. There have been a lot of talk about funds and what the progressive forces should do. Uh, I think we are all grateful that there is a Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, but we are, uh, of course, we all know that there is no Rosa Luxemburg who is giving us money, but those are German taxpayers' money. So basically, this was possible thanks to them. Uh, I'm not sure they would all agree that this is the right thing to do, but we are happy to use their funds <laughs> in, order, in order to change society in which they won't be such a huge such a huge disparity between the core that brings gives us money to start something here uh, if there is money for that there's the money to kick start what we are trying to do here and i think we are doing successfully i think balkan open where people uh, 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 self-organized their panels was a great success. We heard a lot of interesting discussions. I would like also to thank to working groups, that six working groups that have been working on this for months and months in a row to prepare a more focused discussion. This is what was the demand of the first Balkan Forum. We got more focused discussion and of course we got some conflicts which are welcome. We got differences in, in positions, we got obviously different, uh, different ideas, but that in, in itself was, and I think it is, extremely productive. What we want here is not just an annual gathering of friends. We want that throughout the year we keep this cooperation. I think Balkan Open showed that people from different parts of Balkan do work together, organize panel together, and communicate their ideas and thoughts. I think there is a political project coming out of this, and, and we, we could say that as a subversive forum, we'll definitely fight to provide the space for Balkan Forum with, with the help of foundations or without them. And we are not going to, to give up on this because clearly, we, as we said before, we share the same problems. We have to find shared solutions. But it's a gigantic task. This is not the France of 60 million where people share the same framework. This is like 10 countries with different contexts, with different people, different histories, and so on and so on. So it's a, it's a miracle how well it worked, which full, fills me with optimism. So I hope you share the same thing. Okay, Balkan Forum, this year Balkan Forum consisted of two parts. One is the Balkan Forum in narrow sense, which is these six working groups that have been organized by us. I will say something more about that. And the other part of the Balkan Forum was coordinated by Vedrana Bibic. It was Balkan Open. 
And uh, for, uh, I would like to say that uh, for this year, maybe uh, on this Balkan Forum, we've been talking uh, for the, these past two days after every group what was good and what uh, uh, where the uh, play where there is place for improvements. And uh, uh, I hope there will be a publication. Uh, the result of this uh, Balkan Forum will be a publication. But also, I think it's very crucial for this uh, uh, for these themes uh, for these subjects and topics to be continued to 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 be the constant uh, work on them and uh, and that um for the next year, I think that maybe uh, all organizations, well, most of them are not here, but those of you who are, please uh, spread the word, that uh, for the next year, I think that we should focus even stronger, even more on the actual problems of the contemporary problems of the problems that we are in, with a, with a really hard self-reflection, auto-reflection on, on the situation we are in, and how to coordinate uh, different countries to, in order to, to articulate left answers. So I think this is, this is the point of the Balkan Forum, this is why we exist, exist, and this is the direction we want to go into. So, and Avedra now will say something more about Balkan Open, which is uh, also possibly one of uh, another uh, forms of the Balkan Forum to be organized with a more bigger focus next year. Ok, ja ću govoriti na srpsko-hrvatskom jer mi je dosta engleskog ovih dana, a znam da većina ljudi tu razumije hrvatski. To je jedna od stvari koja ja želim uvesti isto u Balkan forum, ali dobro, o tom potom. Uglavnom, ništa bi se htjela zahvaliti prevoditeljicama i volonterima koji daju besplatnu radnu snagu subverziju u 12 sati dnevno za zadnjih tjedan dana. I svim organizatorima panela, pogotovo onima koji su na vrijeme dostavili sve potrebne podatke. Što se tiče samog Balkan Opena, znači ideja je bila da različite organizacije imaju odriješene ruke i organiziraju što god ih zanima na nekakvim bazičnim temama koje smo prošle godine detektirali kao najbitnije i nadam se da je to dobro prošlo, mislim da je, funkcionirali su svi paneli. I ovaj, zapravo, zapravo nemam ništa za doda, slažem se s Androm da se nadam da će svakoj godine biti sve konkretnije i konkretnije i zapravo još jedino što bih htjela doda da, da ovaj, se nadam da će ljudi koji su došli avionima imati strpljenje s obzirom da Kroacija Airlines nadamo se i dalje štrajka. <laughs>